scripture reading this morning is Jude 14 through 25. Enoch, the, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness. And all of them, the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only, great, to, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Well, we're finishing up the, the book of Jude today, um, wrapping that up. And then, uh, as I said last week, uh, next week we'll be doing the, the annual State of the Unity Address. Just going to look at uh, where our church is, where we're at, where we're going. Uh, how do we align with uh, Acts chapter 2, what the early church did? Are we doing that? And what do we need to change, where we need to go. And then following that, we'll do a series on um, spiritual warfare. So if you're interested in that, we're going to talk about the three enemies we war against. Because there are actually three, believe it or not. And so if you want to know what those three are, you got to come to the message. I'm not going to tell you. So I guess you know, I'll, I'll tell you if you ask. But then I'll guilt you. No, I won't guilt you at all. So we're going to jump right into Jude here. Uh, if, if before we begin, though, remember, uh, just to kind of give you a little background... Uh, Jude's short book, he begins by telling the, the church to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith, to stand firm, don't waver from it, because uh, if they do, they'll, they'll suffer the same fate as the false teachers will that's among them. And so last week, we, we looked at the, uh, the seven uh, examples that uh, Jude gives about the false teachers from the past and what they did and what their fate was, and then he talked about six people who were scoffers in the uh, history of, of Israel and what happened to them. So he's given examples to show what the false teachers had done in the past and what their fate was. And so Judas said, so far, don't align yourself with them because you will suffer the same fate. So as we, he ends his little short letter, he begins to wrap it up by one more example and then encouraging the church by telling them, okay, if that's the case, what should we do now? How do we live our lives? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we jump into verse 14. So Father, we are here once again to, to hear from you, to have your, your spirit move among us and, and teach us the things that, that we need to know to, to change our hearts, to transform us, to be more like your son. And so Father, we, we give you our ears uh, so that we might hear from you today. We, we give you our hearts, our attentiveness, God, that you might speak to us, that you might um, do as, as you promised, God. You promised to speak to your people and to move among your people. And so we are here because you are the God who keeps your word. We expect to hear from you today. We expect to be transformed. We expect to be in your presence as your word is proclaimed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, Jude wraps it up by beginning in verse 14 by talking about this prophet Enoch. And he basically says this, that don't, don't be... Uh, confused that judgment definitely is coming because it seems like we talked about before the world is falling apart all around us right and we all want justice right don't we all want justice we want it we want it now the problem is that if we want justice now then we're kind of messy too aren't we and justice will fall on us and so the cross has averted justice for us and uh and but Jude doesn't want them to be mistaken like these false teachers are going to get off the hook like somehow judgment won't come and so he, he basically says judgment is coming there's no doubt and he, he starts by saying this in verse 14 he says enoch the seventh from adam seventh generation from adam according to genesis prophesied about them that's the false teachers that are among jude's people right now see the lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness 
and all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's God or the Lord. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. And so uh, Jude quotes Enoch. And does anybody know where that quote is found? It's in the book of Enoch. And it's not in the, the Holy Scriptures. We'll talk about that in a second. But we mentioned it last week a little bit. What's really interesting here is actually that Jude includes a quote from one of the earliest patriarchs, Enoch. If you remember Enoch, uh, he is the, the, the patriarch that walked with God and then was no more because God took him away. And uh, most scholars believe that he was alive and then he was just, he didn't ever experience death. God just took him into heaven. And so unique in the history of, of um, human beings. And he, his prophecy, basically, that Jude relates here is that, 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 that the uh, ungodly acts that these people are committing will be judged. Remember, Jude isn't so much concerned with the false teachers' teachings, remember? He's more concerned about their acts, how they live their lives. Because with any false teacher, you can identify them as false teachers by how they live way before you probably can identify them by their teaching. And so this is, this is Jude's point here. And so Enoch predicted that the Lord will return to earth with innumerable holy ones. That might mean angels. That might mean angels and saints. That might mean a number of things. It's just, it's not going to be people that are unholy. So God is coming in judgment, holiness against ungodliness, un unholiness. And so uh, what we're not exactly sure is where this quotation comes from. Um, it might have been part of a... A Jewish writing that we don't know of. It might have come from the book of Enoch, which contains a similar statement, but not exactly the same. So most probably it comes from probably oral tradition. Remember, again, we talked about this last week, most people in the ancient world weren't literate, right? They relayed biblical stories, biblical truth, or just general stories of culture through oral tradition. They told stories. They were storytellers. And so this is probably that, an oral tradition from Enoch that came down, maybe later recorded in various books and in the book of Enoch itself. But remember, right as the scripture is often quoted from non-inspired text. It doesn't mean that if it did come from the book of Enoch, that the book of Enoch is inspired. It's just saying that this quote is inspired, not the whole book. And we've seen that before with the examples that he gave in the previous verses here. So it doesn't imply that it's God's word. It's simply Jew trying to make a point from traditions that the Jewish people would have known very well that judgment was coming to false teachers. And so Jude continues his denouncement of false teachers. He, he summarizes their evil character. Again, it's who they are that matters more so than their words, because what comes out of their mouth is a result of what's in their hearts, right? And so he says that their evil character, they grumble, they find fault. You guys know anybody like that, grumbles and find fault? I see that guy every morning when I look in the mirror, right? There's that guy there all the time, right? Because that, that describes me all, often, right? Um, and my wife is like mm, in the back, just shaking her. Yeah, not so so much gusto, maybe just a light shake of the head. That would be nice. So they enjoy finding fault with those who believe God's word instead of doing God's will. They're looking, they're looking to find fault with people. False teachers do exactly what their evil instincts prompt them so that they proclaim to be teaching words of God but what they're actually doing is just they're in it for themselves their instincts they're kind of like animals they just do their own thing and they're in it for self nothing more and that, by the way this is true not only for, for false teachers but for the world in general people function out of their default means and that's their own instincts right we're in it for the for the the uh, the God of self and so the world does not like truth Whenever a light shines on truth, especially biblical truth, um, people just don't like it. Light always illumines the darkness and shows it for exactly for what it is. And because of that, darkness will always try to attack the truth and try to snuff it out. And this is why it's really important for us as believers to live lives that are different. It's more so than proclaiming the truth, which we need to do as well. And Jude talks about that in a little bit. But also, it's our lives that proclaim the truth. Just like the false teacher's lives proclaimed falsehood, our lives can proclaim the truth. And so when we live a life aligned with the truth, when we live a life uh, aligned with the principles of the kingdom of God, yet um, we don't expect any opposition, we, we should. If you live according to the truth, you will expect opposition. In fact, if the pattern of your life 
is not opposed by the world, you are probably most likely compromising in some area. That's just a flat out truth. If, if, you're, if you live a smooth life as a follower of Jesus, if you're just skating through life and you experience no opposition whatsoever, you're probably compromising in areas. How do I know that? Well, the scriptures, but 2 Timothy primarily, 2 Timothy 3, 12. He says, Paul says this, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is it say might be persecuted? Will be. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to follow Jesus with your whole self and follow after him, you will be persecuted. You will, you, you will find opposition. People do not like truth, especially when that truth is lived out because it illuminates the darkness. And so these false teachers are doing just the exact opposite. They're bragging about themselves. They're complimenting other people in order to gain a following so, that they, so they can get people on their side. And you hear things like this, theirs is the, the only way. Theirs is the only church. Their teaching is unique. You won't find this teaching anyplace else but here because we got the corner on the truth. And you hear that sort of stuff in this day and you hear it in, in other places and throughout history. And like those who arrogantly rejected God's truth in the past, these false first century teachers and false teachers today are egotistical. They despise the real truth. They're manipulative. They have a Christian shell on the outside. They look Christian. They might say Christian things, but on the inside, dead man's bones, as Jesus said. And Jude's point simply here in these first few verses before he gets into the solution is simply, don't be deceived. Judgment will come. It seems like it won't. It seems like people that are on the side of darkness have the upper hand, but judgment is coming, and there's only one way of escape. Point two he wants to make as well is to understand that false teachers will always be here. They're, they're always going to be here. Verse 17, he says this, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who will divide you, who follow mere natural instinct, instincts and do not have the Spirit. And so these verses, 17 through 23, really to the end of the, end of the book, lays out Jude's plan of action. What do we do to recognize, resist uh, false teachers that come into the church, into our lives? Or in general, how, how do we live in a broken world where, where darkness and truth seems to be all, a set of truth is all around us? So the prior verse was explaining how explaining why these false teachers are dangerous. That was all Jude's point. Now he's saying, because they're dangerous, and because the end result of their lives will be eternal judgment, how do we escape that? How do we do something different? How do we avoid these liars? How do we also avoid their fate? And so Jude begins by reminding his, his readers what the apostles with Jesus predicted. Jesus predicted that false teachers would come. False teachers are described as emerging in the last time or the last days. So here's where I, I get this all the time, which, you know, people who, who are like theologians, we kind of smirk at this and laugh. People ask all the time, do you think we're in the last days? Do you think we're in the last days? And that, that, you get that question? The, the answer to that question is this. Yes, we're in the last days. Well, how do I know that? Because the Bible describes exactly when the last days begin. The, the last days or the last time, refers to a period of the church, um, church history, which began at the formation of the church 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Because other New Testament writers at first refer to that term, last days or last time, they refer to it in the present tense. They say we're in the last days. The early church was in the last days. So technically, theologically, the last days began at Pentecost and will continue to the end. We are in the last days. Are we close to the end? That's a different question, right? That we don't know if we're close to the end, but are we in the last days? Is the Bible calls the last days or the last times? Yes, we are. And so Jude's point here is that false teachers have been around since the formation of the church, and they'll be around till God sums everything up and brings us home. They're always going to be here. Therefore, we should always be alert, always be watchful. Why? False teachers can cause trouble in churches. Remember Jude's point and other writers' point. False teachers aren't the people that are out there. 
False teachers are the ones that emerge from within the church, and they look and they act just like this, but they're not of us, right? And we have to be careful. They appear to be legitimate believers, but they're not. Jude says that in verse 13. Their influence can lead other people astray. We, we tend, people, we follow people, right? We like to have followers. You know, people like to have a find a leader, right? If we didn't have leaders, we would all be doing our own thing. That wouldn't be good. So leadership is a gift from God, um, as long as that leadership is under the headship of Christ. Um, it says here that, that false teachers divide because they are special. They're, they're blessed by God as opposed to others who are not. Have you heard that in churches? Well, you know, those guys are Christians, but they don't have this. And therefore, if you come here or understand my teaching, you'll have a little bit better insight how to deal with this or this or this. We hear that all the time. And, and that might be true in the sense of people might have an insight into certain things that other people don't. But insight is different than truth about something, right? In a corner on the market on truth. So we see this a lot in the church, and, and I think our Western culture plays into this, right? When we see a church uh, that's successful as far as Western culture, draws big crowds, has big budgets, those type of things, um, those things aren't necessarily bad. You can be a Christ-following church and have big budgets and big crowds, right? You can... But you also can have those things and not be a Christ-following church. You can be a small church like this, right? And have small budgets and not very big crowds and be a Christ-following church. And also you can do, have the same stuff and be a non-Christ-following church, right? The issue is truth and how that truth is proclaimed from the scriptures. And so Jude is, is basically telling us, don't think like you live in a time or you're in a place where you can kind of let your guard down. And everything's going to be okay. You can just listen to anybody and it'll be okay. Be forewarned. There are false teachers. And let me, I said this before, and, and I'll say it again. Do you know where you find most false teachers if you want to read false teachers today? I'll tell you where you find them. You go to a Christian bookstore, and you go to the end cap, right? You go to you know what the end cap is, the end of a thing. The, end, the most popular books that I've seen on the end caps are by false teachers. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk to me afterwards, what do you mean, Pastor Phil? I'll tell you exactly, right? We have people that are on, that are very popular today that aren't Trinitarians, for example. They're modalists. You know what a modalist is? That the Father became the Son, then became the Spirit, right? So one God, they just became different. Not three persons in, in one Godhead. That's heresy. That was thrown out in the early church very, very early on. We have teachers like that today. And, and they're accepted as... Christians, and they're they're not. They're among us, but they're not of us, as Paul would say. So again, Jude's point here is, how do how do we know, right? How do you, you go into a Christian bookstore and go, what's this good? How do you know even what I'm saying up here is good, right? I I just could be one of those guys, right? You got it. We'll get to that, right? How do you know? Because I'm pretty smooth, right? <laughs> I'm extremely good looking. And you could want to follow me, right? But I'll see. That's what guys come in, right? You, oh, that guy's such a—he's such a good preacher, right? He's so handsome, right? Boy, he's a good singer, right? Look at that. The church has such a—all those things draw us, and they should, because we are, as a human being, drawn to excellence, right? That's how God designed us. But we have to be careful, because excellence doesn't always equal godliness, right? Excellence doesn't always equal truth. Those things have to go together. So the application today is simply the application that Jude gives, in beginning in verse 20. He gives us strategies to survive in a fallen world. How to determine where darkness is and where, where, where light is, and how do we choose? Verse 20, he says, but you. When he says, but you, he's saying, you people who are not following false teachers, who are not the false teachers, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. So he's just basically giving us an outline of what we should be doing, how we live our lives. Let's go through them one by one. The first thing he says is build yourselves up in the most holy faith, right? That's the apostles' teaching. Uh, the faith that was culminated by what the apostles gave us and eventually culminated in the Scripture, right? The New Testament, the Old Testament. 
So basically, he says, build yourselves up in the truth, in God's word. We know this. Defense against false teaching starts with growing in the knowledge and application of Scripture. Both those things. Not just knowledge and not just application. Knowledge and application. So you can have a lot of knowledge but little application, right? You can have a, a lot of application but only a little bit of knowledge, right? You need both. A lot of knowledge and a lot of application growing in that. Remember, in writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, right? If you remember that verse... Paul says that Scripture is really important. It's important for all of our growth, for gaining knowledge, for, for encouragement, for all the things we need to grow in faith. That's how we get spiritually mature, by understanding the Word. So, a deep and growing understanding of the Bible is of, is of vital importance. Deep and growing. If you don't know a whole lot, that's okay. Grow. If you know a whole lot, go more, right? It's deep and growing. You never know enough. You never have arrived. Keep studying, keep understanding. Uh, remember back here in uh, verse 12 of Jude, uh, Jude referred to those false teachers as hidden reefs. Uh, the NIV says blemishes. The idea of hidden reefs, which is what it literally says, is the idea that these things are hidden. They don't really show up right away. You just suddenly hit them, right? And you're in trouble. And so errors, spiritual errors can be subtle. So if you just have a general knowledge of Scripture, the subtle errors will take you away. Right? That's what cults do. That's so they drag Christians away is by subtle errors. Just a little nuance, and pretty soon you're way off, off course. Right, And so because these false teachers have rejected the truth in favor of their own preferences, we have to understand that these differences can be subtle to start and eventually drag us away. It doesn't matter if those false teachers are destined for eternal punishment. And Jude's point is, don't be drawn away with them by not knowing the truth. So build yourselves up in the word. Grow in the knowledge of the word. And then linked right to that is pray in the spirit. Well, to pray in the spirit simply means most of the times in the New Testament it says pray in the spirit. He's talking about being controlled by or empowered by the spirit. So when we pray in the Spirit, it's not some mystical thing. We try to, what is the Spirit? I'm going to find it. Okay, I'm praying the Spirit. It's not something like this being, okay, my prayer life needs to be controlled by the things of God. My prayer life needs to be empowered by the things that God wants me to be empowered by. And so Jude's exhortations here is simply echoing Paul's uh, call in Ephesians to um, pray in the Spirit as well. And you can't pray in the Spirit unless you're in touch with the Spirit. And how do you get in touch with the Spirit? Refer back to point A, God's Word, right? The sword of the Spirit, the truth of the Spirit leads to um, praying the Spirit. So you can't know God's will and God's purposes and pray for those things if you don't know God's Word. If you don't know God's Word, then your prayers, my prayers, will always be influenced not by the Word, but by self, right? That's why if I'm just praying without thinking what the Scriptures want, what God wants for the world, then I'm praying for me, right? So I'm going to get there, I'm going to go, Okay, God, should I go to, you know, a foreign country, you know, should I go there and preach the gospel? Ah, let me pray. Lord, um, should I go to a co country? Well, um, Phil, no, you shouldn't go because you won't have all the luxuries on, 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 oh, okay, I probably shouldn't go then. That's how we pray, because comfort's really important to us. But maybe God is telling us, I want you to get really uncomfortable. I want you to sacrifice everything you spent the last 40 years building up and go, right? See, when we pray in God's spirit, we're praying for the thing that God wants for us, not for what we want for self. And those prayers are really, really scary. And so think about the situation. They're in a church where false teachers are rising, and, and uh, Judah's saying, I want you to pray in the Spirit. I want you to step back from all the, the, the factions that may be forming, the popularity of this person, the popularity. I want you to step back and think, I don't care what that faction wants. I don't care what that faction wants. I don't care what that person wants, or that brother or sister wants. I want to know. What God wants. I want to know what the head of the church says in this situation. And I'm going to do that. That's what we pray in the Spirit. And so Judah simply saying, know the, know the Word. And once you know the Word, pray for what God wants. Right? The, the Lord's Prayer begins with what? Right? Who art in heaven. Hallowed be name. Next comes. On earth, right? So yeah. thy will be, that's a, I want the whole thing, Chris. I, I, you get the whole thing. We'll get that later. But the, but right that, your will be done on 
Amen. <laughs> Got to the end. <laughs> on in earth as it is in heaven, right? That's that's praying in the spirit. We want God's will to be done here, right? Now we get you going, Chris. I'm sorry, I get you going there, buddy. Um, so this this is the point. What do we want for the church? Do we want our stuff to be done, or do we want God's stuff to be done? In in a, in a day and age where the church is being assaulted by a bunch of different teachings, what do we want? to do, what do we, who do we want to be, who do we want to follow, and we know that we can pray in the Spirit for God's uh, will if we know what His will is, which is in the Word. And then he says, the third thing is to stay in God's love, to remain in Him. Um, <clears throat> keep yourselves in God's love as you wait. So, believers remain strong. We're stronger when we stay focused on God's love for us right, and do His will. If I forget how much God sacrificed for me and loves me and did for me, then I'm going to stray. But if that's the forefront, if the gospel is forefront in my life, if I'm always remembering that I'm in this position, not because I'm a wonderful guy, but I'm simply God saved me. And I was, I'm lost without him. I'm nothing without him. I'm an object of wrath without him. But he saved me and he loves me. And if I remain in that, then I, there's a number of things in my spiritual life, the dynamics in my life that will, that will take off. Um, Scripture says in Luke 15 that we are we remain in his love if we keep his commandments. We remain in, in the love of God if we do what he says. Again, back to this practical outworking of our lives. Remember the story of the, of the prodigal son, right? He, he goes away. The father still loves the son, right? But as the son's away, he can't experience the love of the father, right? He might even, he might even forget that the father loves him. It's not until that son comes home that the father lavishes love on him and he can experience the love of the father because he's at home so simply staying in god's love simply means that we need to stay home stay in the presence of the father's love and then we can experience the father's love because if we drift away we 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 won't experience his love even though he loves us we won't experience or be able to understand that love and we do that by obeying his commands by following his will praying the spirit all they all kind of flow from one then he says, you stay in God's love, keep yourself in God's love as you wait. So again, wait patiently. This is hard for me. I'm very impatient. I want things done yesterday. Many of us live that way because we're Westerners and we, we like that, things, uh, uh, immediate gratification. And so Jude here urges his, his readers to uh, anticipate the mercy that will come from Jesus when he returns, that our salvation will be full. That will be totally transformed. Sin will leave. Everything will be done. And that includes full and forgiveness because of the cross. So when Jesus returns, the fullness of eternal life and all its accompanying benefits will be realized for all who have placed their faith in him. And so, again, he's telling us, to where's our mind? Where's our focus? Are we worrying about a lot of things all over the place? Are we, are we focused on the end game? Right? Like Paul said, I'm going to run the race. Right? I'm going to go for the goal, forgetting what is behind. All the good stuff, all the bad stuff, I'm going to head towards the goal. That's what Jude is saying here. I'm just going to wait patiently knowing that the goal is coming at some point, and I'm going to reach it. If I'm patient, mercy will come, uh, forgiveness will come, transformation will come. And then he says, while you're waiting, and while you're in God's love, and, and while you're growing in faith, and while you're praying the Spirit, also be merciful. Be merciful. The key attitude that Jude presents throughout his letter, though it doesn't seem like it at first, seems like he's judging people all the time, right? But the whole reason for judgment, God's end game is always to provide mercy. So Jude presents this, this idea of mercy here. Mercy in the scriptures is a caring compassion. It's compassion for someone that actually moves and cares. So I can be compassionate on someone I don't know, but I can't do anything about it, right? I'm compassionate for people who are starving in Somalia. I can have compassion for that, right? But I can't do anything about it necessarily, right? But mercy means I'm compassionate, but I also care. I can actually act out and do something about it and so what he says here is that we as believers should deal with doubters patiently so if people are struggling with their faith we should be patient with them love them harsh criticism and constant judgment will only drive people who are in the state of doubt further away right with people that are in doubt we are compassionate we show mercy to them right um i, I know a lot of people that i've i've shared faith with who uh, have doubt many times on the edge of belief, right? They're very close, but they're not sure, right? And so if we stand in judgment suddenly and harshness, 
then we push them away instead of showing compassion and mercy to them. I'm not saying showing compassion and, and mercy towards sin. That's a different thing. He gets to that in a second. But to them as a human being who is, who is struggling uh, with, with the truth, accepting the truth. So we want to seek people's uh, redemption. And so if people have intellectual questions, we need to be there to answer them. And, and believers can answer their concerns. First Peter 3 talks about that. We can extend mercy to sincere seekers. The false teachers that Judas talking about aren't sincere seekers. They're people who are deceivers, who have self in interest. And Jesus made that distinction too. He would talk harshly to people who are Focus on self. The Pharisees made some of the Pharisees. But to those who were broken and were seeking, he was compassionate, even though they had great sin in their lives. And Judas saying the same thing. And then he says, basically, uh, to snatch people out of the fire. That simply means to share the gospel, right? To snatch them out of the fire from judgment. There are people who are very, very close to eternal punishment. That's not a doctrine I necessarily like, but it is a, it's the truth. So it's, it's there. Um, again, Jude here is not concerned necessarily that people who are in open rebellion. I think he's more concerned about people who are suffering from doubt, and our response should be mercy. If they're on the edge and they're doubting, the, and they snatch them, do something about it. Be the, be the answer to their questions. And say, the point is here, you re, we, we reach out to people actively. We don't just sit on our butts and expect God to move, right? And I said before, we are the movement of God. God's already said, move, go. Right? So don't wait for God to move. He's already told you to move. He told me to move. Move. You cannot snatch someone from the fire by being passive with your faith. If, if I'm over a campfire and I'm making some s'mores, right, and I drop my marshmallow into the fire, I don't go, gee, I hope they'll hop out. <laughs> right? And that's not how I deal with it. I try to get it out of the fire so I can have the s'mores, right? So we never de when something falls in the fire, you either got to get it out or it's destroyed. And it's the same thing with people who are on the verge of eternal punishment. We snatch them out of the fire. We can't be passive with our faith. We have to be active to reach out to them, to go. And that's what Judah's saying here. In the midst of all the trouble, I shouldn't be on self. In the midst of all the false teaching, you do something with the truth. You know the truth. Do something with it. Snatch people out of the fire. And then he says also to hate sin, right? Don't be, don't be so enamored by what's going on that you're kind of drawn into the sinful lifestyle. Uh, Jude portrays unbelievers as so contaminated by immorality um, that sometimes compassion and mercy isn't going to work. That's up to God to change their heart. But we still are called to reach out even to the greatest of sinners in our, in our lives that are around us. Uh, matter of fact, some of us were the greatest sinners in some of our circles that we, we live, grew up with, right? And so uh, we should understand what God wants us to do. So it's we want to reach out to people in their sin. We want to go where they are. That means going to places where people who don't know Jesus are, right? That's what Jesus did. But at the same time, we have to be careful that we're not drawn into the immorality. So we need to know our, our, our limits. So sometimes, you know, I go to I go to bars and I talk to people in the bar, right? It's not, it's I have no problem with that. But if you're if you struggle with alcoholism, that's probably not the place you want to go, right? To talk to unbelievers, right? You, you, there's a weakness there. Go someplace else. So find a place where you can connect with people who don't know Jesus, where you can love them and accept them and and be in their lives and love them right where they're at without any strings attached. Ask me for an opportunity, but don't go into a place where you'll be drawn into the immorality. Jesus reached out with a message of forgiveness to the most sinful members of his society at, of that day. But he didn't participate in their sin, nor did he approve of their sin. It was very clear that Jesus didn't participate in their sin, and he didn't approve of it, but they understood that he loved them. And we can do the same. We can not approve of sin, not get caught up in sin, but yet show people that we love them, whether they believe in Jesus or not, that we still value them as, as a human being, created in the image of God, and we'll love them no matter what happens. We can do that. So we engage the world but we're not stained by it. Engage the world, but don't put yourself in a place where you'll be stained by it. And then finally, point four, Jews sums up by basically saying this, trust God alone. If you're a follower of Jesus, don't ever, ever, ever trust me. Don't trust me. I'm a human being. 
I won't trust you with certain things. You can't trust me for the truth because I'm human. And sometimes, and, and I've told some of you, I, I, I'm passive aggressive, but I'm also codependent. I like to be liked. So I will compromise some things. I try not to. I, I hope God's word is working in me. But understand that about me. Understand that about you as well. The only person that we can trust without a doubt that will never fail us, never, never do anything wrong in our lives is God and God alone. So trust me. And Paul said this, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't follow Paul. Follow Paul only as he follows Christ. People should only follow me and you as you follow Christ. So we trust God alone. So Jude closes with this great doxology, this, this prayer, this prayer of praise, verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority. All these things are what the false teachers want, right? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And so verse 24, 25, um, basically it's saying this. Believers are on the winning side. We will win because we're on the side of Christ. No one can destroy our faith. No one has the ultimate power, the spiritual power, to destroy our faith or knock us out of the Christian race. Right? It's, it's only a, We have that choice. We can choose to leave. But the point is, if you're a real believer, you can't leave. God holds you. You're part of his family. So what he's saying here is God has the power to keep us upright. God has the power at the end of this race to present us without fault to his glorious self. God is the one who sustains us. So follow him. Rely on him. Lean on him. Don't lean on a teacher. Right? I think we, we like to have um, people that, we, that are humans that are the ultimate teachers, right? So in the Catholic Church, they have the Pope, right? He's like the ultimate teacher in the Catholic tradition, right? In, um, in the Protestant or evangelical tradition like us, we don't have a Pope. But we still have these people that we put on pulpits, right? And, and, and these big high pulpits. We go, oh, that preacher, he's an awesome. And we all have them in our head right now. If I said, that, that preacher's awesome, you have names in your head, don't you? Right? You have them. You have people that, that you shouldn't trust in your head because they can go off to the side. The only one we can trust is the Lord. God is the only one that can hold us uh, to himself and present us uh, faultless. So... Teaching that you receive, make sure it's from the Lord. This is what Jesus said. This is from John chapter 10. I'll close with this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You hear his voice. He knows you, and the result is they follow him. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. He holds us. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've placed your faith in him, you are secure. But the point is, you could follow, still follow a false teacher and lose your effectiveness for the gospel. You could waste your life by following after false doctrines. Don't do that. Hear his voice. And where do we hear his voice? Through the word of God. I, I, this short book, I'd encourage you to kind of read it over and over and over again. Because uh, just in a nutshell, with, with that... Close with those verses. What Jews letter does, it describes human beings at their absolute worst and God at his best. And, and the way Jude wraps this up, he says, look how bad these false teachers are and you would be just like them and, and you have no hope of holding on to any salvation in and of yourself and you'll fall and you'll be eternally damned, but God is able to hold you. So follow him. Follow the truth, know the truth, pray in the Spirit, be patient, snatch people from the fire, hate sin in your life, and follow me. And you'll be okay. And the end will come, and you'll see him face to face, and everything will be just the way it's supposed to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this book of, of Jude, or the book of Judas, who, uh, the brother of Jesus, who, which amazes me, God, because... Uh, Often, he doesn't call him, remember what my brother said to you guys? He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude, even being Jesus' half-brother, knew exactly, knew exactly who he was. And Father, we, we want to know Jesus too. We want to, to know you, God, in, in a way that, that is continually growing. 
that our understanding of who you are and what you've done for us continually increases, that we might fall more and more in love with your word, have a growing understanding of it, that we'd be more and more in touch with your spirit so we can pray the things that you desire us to pray so that we can be in step with the spirit, God, and pray the things of the kingdom that those things might happen here on earth. We pray, God, that you would give us mercy, that we'd be able to wait patiently until that fulfillment comes, that that, whatever that time is for us. We pray, God, that you would give us an act of faith that we're able to live out and so that we can snatch people from the fire, that we would not be passive with the gospel, that we would be active finding ways and asking, uh, praying in the Spirit that we might have opportunities to share our faith with those who do not know. And above all else, God, that we would have compassion and real love, that we wouldn't stand in judgment. That's your job. We wouldn't stand in judgment. We would reach out to people, as our mission statement in this church says, that we would reach out to people and love them without any strings attached because that's what you've called us to do. If they come to faith, awesome. Thank you for using us, God. If they don't, God, they're still worthy of our friendship and our love. We can love them right where they're at. But in that, God, protect us from being stained by the world that we might live this life that's holy and pleasing to you, bringing glory to you in our everyday lives with our actions and our thoughts. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.